Hello there, MS over here and welcome to day three of our crash course series. Today we are focusing on consolidated statement of financial position. As we do over here every single day, our focus today as we are looking at consolidations will be on teaching you the exam technique. So I'll take you through a full past exam question from the ICA financial reporting paper. And I'll take you through from beginning to end. We'll solve the entire question. My key focus here will not be on just completing the question and balancing it, but obviously along each step of the way, showing you what you need to do come exam day to ensure that you pass any question they put in front of you. Take note that we could spend one whole year trying to solve every single consolidation question that has ever come in any exam. And on exam day, you probably will still see a note that you've never come across before. The thing is, the point I'm making is, the exam may surprise you in so many ways, but if you have a good exam technique, no matter what comes in front of you, you will secure the needed marks. And it's my firm belief that because this is a crash course session and you are here because you are desirous of passing, I do not need to teach you who a parent is, who a subsidiary is, what goodwill means, what NCI means and all of those things. You definitely have a very basic knowledge or a fair enough knowledge of all of those things. What I will do today, like I keep hammering, is to give you how to answer the exam question. There is a way to solve consolidation questions. There is a way to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. There is a way to put together your answer such that no matter how difficult the question is, you will secure at least a pass mark. And by pass mark, I mean if the question is out of 20 marks or it's a 20 mark question, you should be able to comfortably score at least 11, 12, 13, and in very good scenarios, 18, 19, and on perfect days, 20 out of 20, if you listen carefully. So, as I begin, allow me to quickly give you a high level overview of what consolidations are about anyways. I'm sure all of you have heard different terminologies, parents, subsidiaries, associates, and all of that. On day one, if you remember, I mentioned emphatically now, when it comes to the financial reporting paper, it is based principally on what international financial reporting standards. We emphasize that from the just ended November 2020 paper, as much as 80% of the paper came from international financial reporting standards. We established that a group, group account question in and of itself is also based on IFRS because all the notes in a group account question will be based on IFRS. So on that basis, what are the IFRSs we need to be aware of? When it comes to group accounts so the list of standards for group should tell you that it's a very important area that examiners pay a lot of attention to so the first standard that we need to know is something called ifrs3 which deals with business combinations the next is ifrs10 which is called consolidated financial statement so let's even do it this way ifrs3 is called business combinations IFRS 10 is called Consolidated Financial Statements. Then we have IFRS 11 on Joint Arrangements. We have IFRS 12 on Disclosure of Interest in what? Disclosure of Interest in Other Entities, right? Then this will cover the main IFRS um, suite of standards, right? How about the other areas when it comes to the um, old international accounting standards or the IASs. We also have as part of the list IAS 27 which deals with separate financial statements and then we have IAS 28 which deals with what investment in what investment in associate and joint ventures. Why am I giving you this list of standards? It's just to reiterate the point that no matter what you are doing when it comes to consolidations, you have a number of standards. And if I'm not exaggerating, it is consolidations that has the most number of standards dealing with that particular area. It tells you that when it comes to consolidations, um, it's a very important area. And even those who are interested, when you get to corporate reporting, when you begin to look at something like foreign groups or groups where you need to look at the effect of foreign exchange rates, then you need to even consider what, let me put an asterisk here, you need to consider the effects of what IES 21, which deals with what the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. If you are also dealing with cases where you are required to prepare group cash flows, then you need to even consider what IES 7, 
onwards the statement of cash flows but at your level financial reporting the basics are nothing complicated right these are the things we need to cover so know that this is a standard heavy subject but i'm not going to bore you with the technicals let's begin our work today before we solve the exam question not to groups i have a very simplified approach and if you follow my approach i can guarantee you that no matter what the question is about use this framework and you will be met with success you may not balance the exam question if you don't get all the notes correct but no worries you will end up securing what some level of marks what most students don't know is that there are no marks awarded for balancing the question let me repeat that you don't get any marks for balancing the exam question i have seen marking schemes from different exam bodies acc ica g cms um F2 paper and F1 papers on their advanced financial reporting and financial reporting. None of those papers in the marking scheme would you see anywhere that the examiner says give the student two marks or one mark for balancing the consolidated means of financial position. You don't get marks for balancing. If you balance, it's a nice thing because it means all other things being equal, your entries are all what? Correct. So in that particular case, there's a higher likelihood that you score the full mark. But you didn't score the full mark because you balanced it. You scored the full mark because all your entries were correct. So how are exams marked? Exams are marked based on something called what? Ticks or tick marks, right? So there's a marking scheme that says if the person gets goodwill correct, if the person gets NCI correct, if the person gets the figure for, let's say, provision for realized profit correct, give them half a mark. Give them a quarter of a mark in that order. So if you get it right, you get a tick and you get the mark awarded to it. If you get it right, you get a tick. If you get it wrong, you just don't get the mark. You're not negative marked, right? There's no negative mark in here. As in, what I mean is if you get provision for realized profit wrong, nobody deducts any mark. If you are supposed to get half a mark here, you just don't get the half a mark, right? So your job on exam day, I want you to have this mindset, is that you are going there to pick as many ticks as possible. So the approach I'll use today is, open the template for the question down go to the workings when you work for something you have the figure just go and throw it in the balance sheet or wherever the statement is do not bother with balancing do your clearly detailed workings because don't forget the examiner is giving you marks for what the maximum six possible you see in some marking scenes they'll say give the student um half a mark per tick up to a maximum of 80 ticks Right, so your job is just get many ticks as possible, right? So do your workings clearly, cross reference all your workings to the main question, and you'll be met with success. So, final thing before we start high level overview of groups. When it comes to groups, typically you have what? A parent, you have who? A subsidiary, or a number of subsidiaries, depending on your level. Then you could have entities called associates. I will not bore you with the rules under IS 11 where we have joint ventures and joint operations. Right? Let's focus on the basics today. You need to know this before you even move to the higher levels. So what is the relationship between a parent and a subsidiary? A parent exercises something called control over a subsidiary. And for associates, the parent exercises something called significant influence, right? Obviously, there are detailed rules around, for example, control. IFRS 10 says the parent must have power over the investee. They must have exposure towards um, their involvement with the investee. And they should have the ability to control what their, their returns from the investee. But not to bore you, right? Just know that in terms of percentages, rough estimate, if a parent controls greater than 50% of the ordinary share capital of the voting rights of a subsidiary of an entity, then they have control. And in that case, that entity is deemed to be a subsidiary, right? So if you exercise or you control 50% or more, this is a subsidiary. If you control between 20% and between 20 to 50%, you have significant influence and this is in all cases mostly going to be an associate what happens if it is less than 20 percent this will be deemed as an ordinary investment in an entity and will be dealt with as a financial instrument 
in accordance with what IFRS 9. So entities that you have less than 20%, typically they are deemed as investment in an entity. Ordinarily, they'll end up being what a financial asset or to be specific, it will be an equity investment in terms of being a financial asset in accordance with IFRS 9, it will be carried at what fair value through profit or loss in most um, cases. So this is a high level overview of the standard. Let us start the question. So like I said, this is our November 2019 exam of the ICAG. Let us use this to learn the technique of consolidation. Let us use this to better our ability to answer questions on consolidations. So let's begin. Typically, I tell students to always look at a question, read the preamble, and read the requirement. What's the preamble here? The draft statement of financial position, so they are saying it's draft, of Atia Limited and that of Santana Limited. Assets, please always take note of the year end in group accounts questions. Assets, 30th June 2019 are as follows. So we've been given the financials. Let us see. We are given, as usual, additional relevant information. These are the notes. Perfect. Let's come to the end. We have some extra notes here. What is the requirement? Prepare the consolidated statement of financial position of the ATIA group as at 30 June 2019. And it is for 20 marks. 20 sweet marks that I, I feel anybody here, if you listen to me well and you've done the groundwork and you have a good enough exam technique, you should easily score at least 14, 15, 16, and for the very well prepared ones, even 19 and 20 out of 20 because you can do it. It's within you. All right. So let's go back to the question. What I recommend is you always give this a quick enough read. Have an idea of what they are asking you before you start the exam. It's not a good practice to just start and start solving the question. No, read through the notes. That is why I recommend that the 15 minutes reading time you are given before the exam, you use it judiciously to read through the notes, make some marks on the side to know what exactly you will do where and what you are required to know. So let's start. Without even bothering what the main balance sheet looks like or what it contains, let's look at the notes, right? And let's make some notes on the notes or the, some notes to the notes, right? So note one, on 1st July 2018, then you ask yourself, which day was this? So look at the company's year and it's 30th June 2019 from here, right? So if it's 30th June 2019 and they are saying on 1st July 2018, the company acquired or the purchase, then we know what this is what one year ago, right? So you can write here somewhere that this is what one year ago. If it's one year ago, then you know for sure that this is what a prior year acquisition, roughly exactly one year ago. They are saying the company bought 21 million shares of Santana Limited, okay? And then at this date, the retained earnings, okay? were estimated at 17 million, whereas the revaluation surplus was 2 million. So let me pick my figure so that when we are coming to do the question, we don't read again, right? So I know that I acquired on 1st July 2018. I bought 21 million shares. And then on that date, the retained earnings of the subsidiary was what? 17 million. They had a certain revaluation surplus balance and it was 2 million. All I know is that these are figures at what? Acquisition date. Right, so in my mind, I know all of these are what acquisition date figures. No stress here, let's move on. Note two Atia Limited paid an initial amount of cash of 46 million. So, this is the purchase consideration how much the parent paid to acquire the subsidiary, right? And they agreed to pay the shareholders of Santana. Don't forget, Santana is what the subsidiary, right? A further 14 million CDs on 1st July 2020. Someone will say, why am I assuming it's a subsidiary? Well, in most cases like this, um, hardly would you see them test a scenario where it's a parent and an associate, right? It's either going to be a parent and associate or a parent, a subsidiary and an associate, right? So it's either parent, subsidiary or parent, subsidiary and associate. I've seen a case where they've done parent, subsidiary, subsidiary before, but it's not too common. So here... I know it will be definitely an associate, I mean a subsidiary, but we'll look at it, don't worry. So here, they paid a further 14 million on 1st July 2020, or they agreed to pay, right? So this is something 
where they are promising to pay a certain amount in future because it's a future payment we call this what we call it a deferred deferred consideration deferred consideration I'll, I'll tell you how to treat this when we get there right but just know that apart from paying 46 million today 46 million today they've agreed to pay 14 million on a future date which is what first july 2020 the question is ask yourself how many years ago or how many years into the future is this let's go back to note one when did they acquire the subsidiary watch here carefully they said what on first july 2018 they acquired the company so if they bought the company on july 2018 first july and they said they will pay them july 2020 that is what two years right so they have promised to make another payment two years into the future so our deferred consideration will have a time period or a time value of two years which we'll use in the discounting right but don't worry i'll teach you when we get there the financial accountant has recorded the full amount of both elements of the consideration in the investment as shown in the statement of financial position what they are saying is that if i go to the balance sheet and i see investment here this figure right here right they are seeing this sixty thousand cities here includes both the immediate consideration and the future or deferred consideration why is this important as we'll find out shortly you need to eliminate the investment figure that relates to that particular subsidiary so if they are saying the full figure of sixty thousand includes both deferred and um, current current period um, consideration then you need to what look at the full figure for elimination purposes right but don't worry we'll treat it when we get there let's keep going then they are saying the company at as a parent has a cost of capital of eight percent per annum the only reason they gave us this is to do something called what discounting and what are we going to discount we'll discount the deferred consideration to present value and we'll do one one thing that students forget to do that is what unwinding of interest once you discount in accounting you need to unwind this principle is common under um, is 37 provisions contingent liabilities and contingent assets it's common once again here under group accounting ifrs 10 right so take note we need to what, do some unwinding of interest i'll teach you how to do that and the double entry that is appropriate next note during the accounting period atia limited who is the parent sold goods totaling an amount of 4 million cds so they sold goods totaling 4 million cds to santana who is a subsidiary so here always when you see a sale transaction ask yourself who did the selling did parents sell to subsidiary or did subsidiary sell to parent that will determine the proper accounting treatment you need to allocate to it so here atia is the parent santana is a subsidiary so i write here that what p sold to s right parent sold to sub so that i know how to treat it at the back of my mind once again when we get there i'll show you what to do right and they said it's as a gross profit margin of 25 percent please take note this question could have said a markup so there are two ways you could have this question markup and margin this is margin when we get there i'll show you how you would have treated what if it was a markup so that you can you are covered if both cases arise okay what else have they told us here they are saying at 30th june 2019 take note that is what the year end if you watch here 30th june is what the year end right so they are saying as at that particular date santana limited still had a total of what 0 0.5 million cds of these goods in inventory right so this is something called what inventory that has not been sold or to be more specific it's called unrealized inventory and i'll show you something called provision for unrealized profit shortly right then they told us that the company has a normal margin usually to third party customers at 45 percent right so this is what we call their arms length um, profit margin right it may not be of too much use here to us but at least we know that they are selling to the subsidiary at what a reduced um or on special um, business basis if it was to the market or it was to a third party who was independent of the business it would have been a different trade term right next note 
which is very common it appears in lots of group questions on the acquisition date the fair values of santana limited that is a subsidiary their net assets were equal to their carrying amount so it means with the exception of this particular asset here what they are saying is what with the exception of some inventory right all their other assets approximate their fair value it means ideally or realistically they are carrying all their assets at fair value so there's no need to do something called a fair value adjustment right but they are saying that some inventory is not fair valued so they are saying here that inventory cost them 1.5 million but the fair value is 1.8 million so it means they are carrying this inventory at less than fair value so we need to fair value adjust this inventory upwards and reflect this entry in the consolidated statement of financial position take note that this valuation was at acquisition date as you can see here so it means what on year end or reporting date which is 30th june 2019 they're saying 10 percent of those goods remained in inventory so it means you need to proportion take the proportion of what fair value adjustment at year end and use that figure the next note it is the policy of atia limited to value nci non-controlling interest using the fair value method right for this purpose the value of the nci at acquisition date we need this figure to do so many things right is estimated to be 7.5 million so we know that the fair value of nci at acquisition will be worth 7.5 million then Next, they said impairment test was conducted at year end and no goodwill impairment had occurred. So here they had not suffered any impairment of goodwill and the rules of impairment of goodwill are clearly stated under what IFRS 3 business combinations as well as what IS 36 on impairment of assets. So here we have been given the relevant information. We have been told what we need to know when it comes towards this particular question. How do we approach a group accounts question? Like I told you earlier, you have just one goal, you have just one job on the exam day, and it's to pass. You are not there to please anyone, you're not there to balance any question. Your job is to pick up as many marks as possible. So this 20 marks you see here, this 20 marks you see here, your job is to get as much as possible of this as you can. At the minimum, tell yourself that you are, you are not walking away with what anything less than what 11 marks because if you score 11 over 20 what you have done is that you've passed this question because for me i even tell people professional exams are easy you've been given five questions 20 marks each your job is just get 10 over 20 in all of them and you've passed i mean if you pass every question you've passed the whole paper right go go there with that strategic mindset so here's 20 marks tell yourself that there's no way you are going to score less than 11 if you end up scoring 19, 20, 17, perfect, right? But tell yourself that nothing below 11 will be your portion. Like, you are not going to settle for anything less than 11 because you need to pass this question. Anything 10, 9, 8, you have failed and you'll be in trouble because you need another question to balance your shortage here. You rather want to use a question like consolidation, which is very easy because it's, well, it's more technical. It follows a certain procedure to get as many marks as you can. So on that note, let us begin the question. My approach or what I'll tell you to do is I need as much real estate as possible. So let me um, do this. So I'll be moving the screen around a lot. So don't worry. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out. So what I want us to do is to open our statement, right? What do I mean by open our statement? Let me try and divide my screen into two so that I don't have to move around too many times. Okay. So on exam day, assume that the left hand side of what I've divided right is where you want to prepare your your statement your consolidated statement of financial position the right hand side will be your workings i am not saying on exam day divide your page into two no take it like this is your page one on the exam sheet right and this is your page two that's what i mean right so at the, at the back of your sheet if you feel you need more than one page and obviously that's up to you but the point i'm making is have one full page dedicated to the statement another full page dedicated to workings Anytime you have a figure that you can move over to the statement, you do that quickly. Because your job is, by the time time is up, you should have what? Gathered enough ticks. All you want is ticks. Forget about balancing. All you want is ticks. Like I keep saying, if you end up balancing it, that is what? The cherry on the cake, right? Or the cheese or whatever they call it, right? 
So let's come to the question. What did they say? They said prepare the consolidated. So give me a second. Prepare the consolidated means of financial position of Atia Group as at 30th June 2019. So that's what exactly what we're going to do exactly, right? So it is called the Atia Group. Um, let me reduce this a little bit. Yes. So we're going to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position as at was the year end again as at 30th june 2019 you underline it neatly then on your page two you just write here what workings follow my approach and you pass a consolidation question right just follow through carefully. So you have your workings on one side and you have your statement on the other side. Good. Now, when it comes to consolidations, if you want to pass, there are standard workings. If you ask me, there are three main workings that you can place everything under. You have working one, which is the group structure. You have working two, where you place something called consolidation adjustments all the things they give you in the notes that you need to adjust to go to work in two then within working two you also prepare something called what the net assets right the net assets of the subsidiary then you come to work in three work in three contains three things goodwill nci and consolidated retained earnings in questions where you have an associate you need to add another working for what investment and associate but for now it won't be a headache in this question so I start with working one, which I said is called what? Group structure. So let's draw the group structure and take note, you get marks for drawing the group structure. People didn't know this, right? You get marks for drawing the group structure. You get half a tick or half a mark. It's still a mark that will contribute to your success long term. So let's come to the question and let's see what the question says about the group structure. So I remember I was in note one. They said what on 1st July 2018, Atia Limited purchased 21 million shares of Santana Limited. So if they bought 21 million shares, how many shares did Santana have? Easy. Here, they are saying ordinary share capital. Watch here. Ordinary share capital. This is Santana, right? It's what? 30,000. But it's in thousands, so that would be what, 30 million. So it means they bought 21 million shares out of what 30 million shares so with that information let's come to our workings we'll say what percentage acquired will be what 21 let's even say all workings in thousands right also all all figures in what ghana cd thousands right in thousands of cd let me write this well We say all figures in Ghana CD thousands. Let the examiner know. So good. They acquired 21 million of how many? We established that what was 30 million, right? So what would the percentage be? Just take your calculator and find 21 over 30. What does it give you? 21,000 over 30,000. It gives me what? 70%. So it means at here control 70 percent of santana and remember the framework i gave you anything above 50 percent you have what control and this will be a subsidiary so we'll say this is a 70 percent subsidiary say therefore nci will be what 30 percent so the group structure will be what the parent owns some shares in the subsidiary and they own what 70 percent therefore nci is what 30 percent and you need to also write what they did they acquired the subsidiary so we say this was what acquired this was acquired in a second one year ago remember i told you in the notes they mentioned that what they bought a subsidiary one year ago so this is our group structure right we have our group structure done working one is done let's go back to the notes and see what else we can pick up 
So we know that what we've cleaned up working one. But if you look at working one, um, note one, it still tells us that at this date, that's acquisition date, we have what the opening balance of retained earnings and what the revaluation surplus also its opening balance. So let's go to working two. Let's do all our consolidation adjustments. Let's see which ones affect net asset and then we prepare the net assets of the subsidiary, right? So, taking that I told you, your job is what? Pick up ticks. By now, you have what? Your first set of ticks under the group structure. So, let's keep going. Then we come to working two, which is called what? Consolidation adjustments. Right? That's our working two. So what comes to working two? Working two is essentially what all the nodes in the question that you have to work for, you work for them right under working two so that you have a centralized place where you what you control all the things in the question. Let's make a mental note that note one has given us what the figures for opening balance when it comes to what retained earnings and then what revaluation surplus, which can be seen right here. Revaluation surplus and then what retained earnings. You see? So what we'll do is we will go to the next um, note. Now look at note two. They are saying what? Actia Limited paid an initial amount of cash of 46 million CDs and agreed to pay the shareholders of Santana a further 14 million on 1st July 2020. The financial accountant has recorded the full amount of both elements of the consideration in the investment. And look at note three. Actia Limited has a cost of capital of what? If you can see of what eight percent right here per annum so under working two let's work for what purchase consideration so our first working i will be on what the purchase consideration right so let's work for how much basic consideration will go into determining goodwill don't forget that when it comes to goodwill we need to always what determine purchase consideration right so how do we arrive at our purchase consideration in this particular scenario right here they told us that what so we know that immediate cash payment was what let's come back here they said they paid what initial amount of 46 million if you can see here right 46 million so we say this is what 46 uh, let me do this so that will be Ghana CD 46,000 right okay and they agreed to pay a further 14 million on 1st July 2020 so I have something called so this immediate cash payment so the next will be what deferred consideration deferred consideration of how much they agreed to pay a further um, i kind of missed that 14 million two years from now okay so 14 million in two years now when it comes to deferred consideration there is a way to treat deferred consideration right or there's a way to calculate deferred consideration if the consideration is deferred, my people, what you are required to do is to discount that deferred consideration to present value. That is all. You will discount your what your deferred consideration to present value using the cost of capital they gave you. Here they said it was 8% in note what? 3. So, we we'll just say IFRS 3. You don't need to mention this if you don't know. It's fine, right? IFRS 3 requires deferred consideration to be included at its what present value so we need to just say and i'm sure all of you know this present value equals what future value over one plus i or r to the power n this is basic time value of money that i'm sure everybody here already knows so the present value will simply be what this fourteen thousand here, right? This fourteen thousand here. So fourteen thousand divided by one 
plus what the rate is 8% to 0.08 to the power how many years take note they said they'll pay in two years time so we need to use to the power two right if you mix this up you mess up big time so to the power two so let's all use our calculators and find the present value of this amount so in my calculator when i punch this i get ghana cd 12,002.74 I entered a full thing so I don't know I don't know what um, you get but if you find the discount factor and multiply by it you might get something less but I put in the full figure and I got 12,002.74 and because I want you to understand what is happening in the background I won't even use double entry to explain to you so that at least you know that what you are doing there's meaning behind it what we have done here is to say that this deferred consideration its present value as of today is 12,000. so what we'll do is we will what we will debit the cost of investment in the subsidiary right with this figure 12,002.74 and then we will credit credit the deferred consideration with what 12,002.74 take note that this is the figures that will feed into the consolidated financial statement so effectively this debit figure is what will go into goodwill so we'll use this 12,002 to compute what our goodwill right so we know that we can conclude that our total purchase consideration would therefore be what the cash payment of 46,000 plus what the present value of what the discounted one of what 12,000 right so we can say here that total purchase consideration will equal what our 12,002.74 plus what? 46,000, right? So plus 46,000. This will give us what? My calculator, give me a second. Plus 46,000. That gives me what? 58,002.74. What? So this is my total purchase consideration that I'll use to do my goodwill. So that deals with what? The purchase consideration element. But what most students don't know is that anytime you discount something to present value, you need to unwind every year. It's called unwinding interest. Why do we do this? It is to account for what the potential time value of money. So here, something was in the future. What you have done is you've brought it to present value. No problem. But you need to find a way such that at every reporting period or at the end of every reporting period, you account for the fair and the time value of money effect. So we need to what by unwinding it simply means take the present value and multiply by the interest rate. And that difference will be used to what increase the value of the liability and the corresponding figure will go towards the parent's retained earnings. Because they are the ones who have promised to make payment. So any interest must what hit their account. So next thing we'll do is what? This is something many students miss. So if you do it, you are among what the top 10%, I guess. Right? So next we'll say is what? Unwinding interest on what? Deferred concede duration so deferred consideration what is the present value we had what 12,000 and 002 here right so we pick that figure 12,002.74 and we multiply by what eight percent right so this will give us the unwinding for year one which is the year in which we are reporting so my calculator 12,002.74 times 0.08 will give me what 960 point what two two so this is my unwinding interest this is how much interest i'm going going to what unwind every year but how do i record this i like to do double entry because it gives me at a visual level 
what figure is going where. Many people do consolidations in a mechanic state, right, in a mechanical method. But if you understand the double entry behind it, you know, okay, this is going here. Right, so this is my first set of double entry. Let's do the next one here. So for unwinding interest, see it like this. It is called unwinding because, let me make you understand, you have brought something to present value. Your job is to what? increase it by a certain time value effect such that by the time the future dates arise, the figure that you have to pay is what will be in your payable figure. Do you get it? So here, we unwind it in year one, unwind it in year two. By the end of year two, what will be there as a balance will be exactly what the parent promised to pay in two years' time. You get it? So this is 960. Where it will go first is to increase the liability from its present value to its value as at end of year one. So it's like you're moving along the time value of money timeline, right? So I will credit my what deferred consideration with what 960.22 this will move my deferred consideration from what present value to end of year one right because that's what we have been asked to prepare the financials then i will debit what the parent um retained earnings right so i'll debit what parents or the group so parents retained earnings why it is a parent who promised to pay this deferred consideration so the effect of what the effect of the the time value effect or the effect of unwinding this is essentially an interest cost or a finance cost the parent must bear that finance cost because it's essentially a financing arrangement right i'll pay you in future but let me have control of you today so it's like they've promised you something in future, but they're already having the benefit today. So they must incur the cost that comes with that as well. So this is to record the deferred consideration. Take note. And take note so far. Remember I told you your job is to get ticks, right? So far you have acquired so many ticks. So let's keep going, right? Let's keep going. Your job is to pick up ticks as long as, long, as, long as you can work, go along the way. So let's come back to the question. We've addressed nodes two and three. Let's look at note 4. During the accounting period, Atia Limited sold goods totaling an amount of what? 4 million CDs to Santana at a gross profit margin of 25%. So we know we are going to do some calculation based on what? A margin of 25%. No worries. They said at 30th June 2019, that is year end, Santana still had a total of what? 0 0.5 million of these goods in inventory. This is called... I told you what, unrealized inventory, inventory that has not been sold. The last sentence is kind of redundant, it's useless. This RTR Limited has a normal margin, usually to third parties at 45. This question is not about third parties, so you can what, reliably or comfortably ignore the 45%. Your job is to compute something now called what, provision for unrealized profits, right? So um, what did I do here? Okay, so this was I. Please take note, I'm cross-referencing all my working. So I'm, this is working 2i. It deals with what? Purchase consideration, right? So I'm going to do working 2ii, which deals with what? Work and provision for realized profits. So working 2ii deals with provision for unrealized profits. I decided to call it PUP. You see some boosts to call it PURP, right? Whatever you call it, it doesn't matter as long as you're getting it right. So here, this is what they said is gross profit margin. So gross profit margin of 25%. Gross profit margin of 25%. This is how I visualize... Um, these things listen to me and you will not get any markup and margin question wrong anytime you see something like this always write this relation right write c plus p equals s right and tell yourself this that markup is on cost margin is on selling price i'll tell that again markup is on cost Margin is on what selling price. So anytime you hear something, somebody say margin, it means you are computing that thing on what selling price. If you hear someone saying markup, it means you are computing this thing on cost. This is from very um, basic primary school um, profit markup and margin. They thought that's what I use and it works, right? So here they are saying gross profit margin. 
So it means it's on what? Selling price, right? If you know that, the next rule you need to, please write it down. First thing you need to write down is what? Markup is on cost. And next sentence you write is what? Margin is on what? Selling price. Next thing you need to write is, put 100 on top of what? Whatever it is on. Right? Put 100 on whatever it is on. What do I mean? This question says it's margin. Right? Gross profit margin. What did I see? I said margin is on what? Selling price. I just said put 100 on whatever it is on. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put what? 100 on S. That's all. Because I said put 100 on what it is on, right? And margin is on selling price. So I put 100 on S, right? Good. Now, the question will always give you the profit figure. So here they are saying is what? 25% right here. So I put, this is C, which is cost. P is what selling price and P is profit, sorry, and S is what selling price. So I put 25 on top of P. Then I need to, I can work back for what the cost element will be. Here, simple um, change of subject, the C will be what 75. So if I have this, I can now work and find a provision for realized profit. How? If you come here, they said what? At 30th June 2019, Santana still had what a total of 0.5 million of these goods in inventory. That is a portion they had not sold. So if there's anything to be worried about, that is a portion of profit you need to eliminate. Because that's the, the portion of profit still sitting within the group that needs to be what eliminated. So what we need to do here is to say, and I hope you know that the 0.5 million or the 500,000 is the selling price, right? So it means we know the S, we are going to use what? Ratio and proportion, right? So I'm going to say, if my S, right, which I know to be 100, equals what? Ghana CD. They said it's 0 0.5, that's 500,000. So I'll just say equals 500. Then what will P be? And P is what? 25, right? So I put 25 here. You can put X here and you can cross multiply to find. But what I'll be doing is to do what ratio and proportion simple. So I want to find 25. So 25 divided by what 100 times 500 will give me the portion that relates to 25. So essentially, it will give me what 25 divided by what 100. That's 25% times what 500. So I know here that my provision for realized profit will be what 125. Right, 125. Let me show you how it would have been if it was the question said markup instead, right? I'll clean it afterwards. So just watch. If the question said markup, once again, remember I told you just write C plus P equals S. So C plus P equals S. And then we go back to the basic rules I told you. Remember I said markup is on cost, margin is on what? Selling price. Next rule is what? Put 100 on top of whatever it is on, right? So here, if it's going to be markup, I said markup is on what cost, so I put 100 on what cost. I know my P equals what? 25, so my S would be what? 100 plus 25, that would give me what? 125. So, the question gave me selling price to be what? 500,000. So, I'll say if my S, which stands for what? 125 equals 500 CDs, then what to my P, which stands for 25, equal? So, it will be 25. You can put x here and you cross multiply but as usual i would say if i know 25 and it is less than what 125 then times 500 so here would have been instead what 25 over 125 times what 500 and that would have given me what 100 so take note if it was markup you would have what had 100 instead right this is how to do markup but since this question is not markup let me wipe this I don't need markup here. All right, so let's continue. So now that we found the provision for unrealized profit to be 125, what is the double entry for this? I want you to understand that everything you do in groups is accounting, right? People just memorize the format. There is a double entry behind it because you're actually recording transactions. Provision for unrealized profit is essentially what an amount of profit that sits within inventory. Take note that the principle of group accounting in IFRS 3 and IFRS 10 is that a group is deemed to be a single business entity and as such, they shouldn't be trading among themselves in the first place. So if they've sold inventory to themselves and they have made a profit on that inventory, we need to eliminate the profit. 
such that when we add the assets of parent and subsidiary, we'll only be adding the pure or the raw inventory values without any profit on that sale of inventory. So our job here is to remove the provision for realized profit. But how you will treat this will depend on who did the selling. If So write this down somewhere. If So let's write this. Please all of you should write it down. If parent sold. So write. If parent sold. NCI is what? Unaffected. If subsidiary sold. NCI is affected. If parent sold. If parent sold subsidiary, that's what I mean. NCI is unaffected. It's not affected. If subsidiary sold, then NCI is affected, right? And I'll tell you what I mean by this shortly. So what I mean is, if the subsidiary sold, you know that in, in group account, right, there are two main engines. See it as engine rooms, right? Everything that has to do with the subsidiary will be recorded in the engine room of what? Net assets, which I'll prepare shortly. Everything that has to do with the parent will be recorded in the engine room of what? The parent retained earnings working, right? So if the parent sold to the subsidiary, then the provision for realized profits will go and hit the parent retained earnings engine room. It doesn't affect the net assets of the subsidiary. That's why I say NCI is unaffected because we use the net assets working to feed into what? Goodwill and NCI. So... On that note, here, let's come to the question and find out who sold to who, right? Let's find out who did the selling. Look at note 4. During the accounting period, Atia Limited sold goods to who? Santana. So, parent sold subsidiary. If parent sold, then NCI is unaffected. It means what? It will affect the parent directly. If that is the case, this provision for realized profits I've recorded of computer of 125 will go to what? Parent retained earnings. First thing I need to do is what? I will credit my inventory with 125. This figure will reduce or remove what? The 125 component from the inventory such that it will strip the inventory and leave only what? The cost element. Then the debit will go to what? Parents retained earnings. So 125, right? 125. So this is it right here. Okay. So this will record the provision for a realized profit of what? One, two, five. I know it will hit the parent um, retained earnings account. Okay. Let's keep going. What else do we need to work for? Um, note five. Yes, note five. On acquisition date, that's at the date of acquisition, the fair values of Santana Limited, so give me a second, the fair values of Santana Limited's net assets were equal to their carrying amount with the exception of some inventory, which had a cost of 1.5 million, but a fair value of 1.8 million. So it means they had what? They had to be revalued upwards by an extra what? Um, what? 300,000. Um, then on 30 June 2019, 10% of these goods remain in inventory of the subsidiary. So this is the subsidiary's inventory. If it has been fair value adjusted, then it has to go to, go to the subsidiary's net asset. Remember I told you the net asset is the engine room of the subsidiary. Anything that has to do with the subsidiary will go towards the net asset of the subsidiary. So this was my II. So my III working to III has to do with what? It has to do with something called fair value adjustment, which I'll call FVA in this question, right? Let's just call it FVA so that we're on easy term. So we'll just say what FVA relates to inventory of who of the subsidiary. So, we we'll just say fair value adjustment equals what? A gain of what? 300.
how did I get 300? It's essentially going to be what? They said a fair value is 1,800 or 1 1.8 million. And the initial cost was what? 1,500. Right? So we'll just write at acquisition equals 300. Because take note, they are saying that, watch here. They are saying that on acquisition date, the fair values were equal with the exception of inventory, which had a cost of what? 1.5. But a fair value of 1.8, right? So it means at acquisition date, the gap between them was what 300,000. But they are saying as at 30th June, which is the reporting date, 10% of those goods remained. So it means technically only 10% of this gain will still remain at reporting date. So I'll call this at CSFP date. Please, CSFP is what consolidated cement of financial position, right? So at the balance sheet date or the year end right only 10 percent remained so this would be what 10 percent of 300 which would give me what 30. so i know acquisition is 300 csfp date is what 30 right okay so i know where to send these figures right i know where to send these figures the both of them will end up going towards the net asset of the subsidiary right so let's keep going what i need to worry about now for sure is what the year end figure of 30 which will affect what inventory because take note they are saying inventory has to increase in value right so because we're preparing the balance sheet at year end your your major worry is to say well you know that as at year end what is really your matter or what's really your headache or what's really your concern when it comes to inventory is that your inventory would have increased by what 30 and not 300 because you are saying as at year end only 10 percent of the goods remained so my double entry will be what i would debit my inventory with what 30 to increase it by whatever value it is by what that extra 30 and then i will credit what anyone can guess I'll credit the net assets of who subsidiary with what 30. Remember, I told you that's the engine room of the subsidiary, the net assets. So that will go and reduce what oh no, increase the sub's net assets by an extra 30 because the net assets is an equity account. So a credit to an equity account will increase. So this 30 will go and increase the subsidiary's net assets base. I want you to understand what we are doing, right? don't just memorize the procedures know that there is a procedure behind what group accounting and like i keep saying you can see i'm just picking ticks as we are going along as many ticks as possible and that's what will give you the pass mark don't bother about um, balancing obviously here we'll try to balance it if we can right but your job really is to ensure that you pick up as many ticks as possible so we've done um note five let's do notes six note six is nothing to do i guess right they are saying it's a policy of atia to value nci using fair value okay so nci will be fair value and the figure is 7.5 note um note seven says there's no impairment of goodwill okay so we can start the question you can see that now that i have all my adjustments done i can comfortably say i'm preparing my net assets right so this is what i do I say net assets of subsidiary as at as at two dates, right? As at acquisition date and then as at what CSFP date. Some books will say asset acquisition date, some will say asset reporting date, right? I'm using acquisition and CSFP date. It's the same thing. Now, what figures will come here? Take note, it is net assets of the subsidiary. So we don't prepare net assets for the parent ever, ever. You only prepare for the subsidiary. If the question has an associate as well, then you prepare two net assets, one for the subsidiary, one for the associate. And that will be the engine room for both of them where you do all your workings, right? So let's keep going. Let's try and find um, the net assets figures. 
So what does net asset even mean in the first place? Net asset essentially means what? Equity, right? Net asset means equity <laughs> at a very basic level. So if net asset, if net asset really means equity, then it means let's come to the equity section of the balance sheet here, right? This is where we need to look. And everything here that relates to the subsidiary, that is this, this column, is what goes to what our net assets of the subsidiary. Ignore what goes in the parent column. So what do you see first here? You see what? First thing is ordinary share capital. So we come here. So let's even pick them up first. Ordinary share capital, retained earnings, revaluation surplus, right? So you just come to your question, your workings here. Your first line, you write. Okay, let me change the pen. Ordinary share capital. The next we had was what? Retained earnings. Then the next we had was what? Revaluation surplus. And what you do next is whatever you see on the question in front of you will go straight to CSFP dates. The last column right this last column here right whatever i see on the question will come there direct so you can see we have thirty thousand. so we bring here thirty thousand. then we have what eighteen two fifty so we pick thirty thousand. we have next is what eighteen two five zero then we have what two thousand so those are figures on the balance sheet, right? So those would be your reporting or your year-end figures, right? Then now we need to figure out what the acquisition date figures are. Forgive my crooked line over here in this one. <laughs> uh, okay. So how do we find acquisition date figures? Acquisition date figures are given to us in what? Note 1. If you watch Note 1 carefully, they are saying what? On 1st July 2018, at purchase, blah, blah, blah. At this date... The retained earnings, right, of Santana was what? 17 million. So I come to this acquisition date, right? I put here what? 17 million. Then, whereas the revaluation surplus was what? 2 million. So I come here, revaluation, I put here 2,000, right? You can see I was not given ordinary share capital, opening figure. What you need to do is always assume is equal to what the year end figure, unless the question tells you that they say something along the lines of since acquisition, the subsidiary has issued new shares, right? If they say something like that, then it means that figure was lower and they've increased or issued more shares. Here, we don't have any information that says the subsidiary issued what additional shares after acquisition. So, in that case, the Acquisition date shares figure will be the same as what the reporting date figure for shares, right? But we are not done with the net assets. Remember, we did some workings and some things would affect what the subsidiary. And I told you the net assets is the engine room for who? The subsidiary. So let's go to our workings up here and see what we said to hit net assets. The first thing here, you can see what? Um, here, right here. Right? Unrealized profit. But take note, for unrealized profit, there's a way to treat it, right? Anytime you have unrealized profit in a question, what you are required to do is to what? Put in the question under net assets two figures. Because let me show you here. Look at note, um, note 5. They said at acquisition date, that was when there was what a difference of 300,000. So it means I need to have a new line here for what FVA, which I'll call fair value adjustment. Now the acquisition date figure was what? The gain was what? If you watch here, it was what? 300. So I'll put 300 here and I'll put the same 300 here. I'll tell you why. Anytime fair value adjustment is done at acquisition, please ensure that what you put the um, figure so in a normal question, right, what you'd have done was ensure you put the figure at acquisition date and CSFP date. But here, the question was specific. You know, this is a unique question. Most questions to tell you at acquisition, net assets was this figure. But here, they told us the acquisition was 300,000 difference. Year end was 10% of it. So technically, what we need to have at year end is 30. 
right? So instead of having 300 at both angles, we have about 30. But take note, in most questions, you put the same figure there, and then you find the figure for year, and then also record that separately, right? But here, you've been told specifically that the um, year-end figure is 10% of the acquisition. So take note, some questions will say, at acquisition, a fair value exercise was carried out and it was realized that all the assets or all the net assets of the subsidiary approximated their current value with the exception of what, or approximated their fair value with the exception of what an item of plant that had a fair value of say 10 million in excess of its current amount. Because it's acquisition, you put the same figure at both um, start and year end. But here they were clear, acquisition 300, year end 30. So this is a peculiar question. Let's go up and see what else affected net assets. Remember I told you PUP here will go towards the parent retained earnings, so it doesn't come to. But take note, if it was a subsidiary who sold, then we would have done this. Let me show you. If the subsidiary sold, we would have written here PUP is always dash at acquisition. Then what did we get? PUP was 125, right? Then I would have deducted 125 from here. Take note, if the question said subsidiary sold to parent, this is what I'd have done. I would have put a PUP under year and then deducted it, right? But here's parent that sold, so it doesn't come here. If sub sold, this is what you'd have done, what I just showed you. So let's keep going. This is parent. Unwinding interest for parents, cost of investment. Yeah, so that's it. This question doesn't have anything else for the subsidiary to be recorded here. So we can close off and find the total. So here, what is the total here? What is the total here? So my calculator, give me a second, let me pull this up. I have 30,000 plus 17,000 plus 2,000 plus 300. This gives me 49,300. Then the next thing is what? 30,000. Let me make you follow. 30,000 plus 18,250 plus 2,000 plus 30. That gives me 50,280. Okay. That gives me 50,280. Right? Okay. So now we are done with our net assets. We can comfortably close this chapter off. Remember I told you working one is group structure Working two is called, let's go, let me show you. Working two is called what? Consolidation adjustments. And at that, you do all your adjustments, including net assets. Working one is called what? Group structure, right? So let's keep going. Let's go to working three. Working three is where you work for goodwill, you work for NCI, and you work for what? Consolidated retained earnings, right? So... I come to my working three. So working three I is for good will. Good will has a standard template. You pick your fair value of consideration. You add your fair value of NCI at acquisition. Then you less your fair value of net asset at acquisition. That gives you good will. If there's any impairment, you less that and you get what? Your good will at net book value in the consolidated statement of financial position so fair value of consideration if you remember in this question we have two components of consideration so we can just say what um cash consideration and the next is what deferred consideration so let's come up and pick our figures um cash was what 46,000 right then we had 12,002.74 okay i meant 46 million anyways right so 46 million i mean thousands and 12 what was the figure sorry i wasn't paying attention um 12002.74 okay 12002.74 Zero zero two point seven four, right? Okay, then the next thing I add is what fair value of NCI at 
acquisition. And if you watch here, note 6 gave me that figure. They said what? The fair value of NCI at acquisition is what? 7.5 million. So I just come here and I drop here 7.5 million. Next thing I need to do is what? I will less the fair value of net assets at acquisition. So I just go to my net assets I did here and I pick the acquisition figure right here of 49,300. Take note, this figure is used to compute goodwill, right? So 49,300. So I deduct and what does that give me in terms of goodwill? So calculator once again. Give me a second. Let me pull that up. 46,000 plus 12,002.74 plus 7,500 minus 49,300. That gives me a figure of 16,202.74. So this is my goodwill. Take note, if the question told you there was impairment, you just said what? Less impairment. But let's even do it so that at least you guys are used to it. So this less impairment, which is what dash in this question, so we say therefore goodwill will be what sixteen two zero two point what seven four. So this is our goodwill that will go to the balance sheet, right? So at this point, I can start dropping my figures because I have some numbers already. So I come to the balance sheet. Oops, this is a balance sheet, right? And it is Ghana CD in thousands, is it? Yes. So I just say. Ghana CD in thousands. So I have my goodwill. And why do I need to cross reference? Remember, this was what working three. Goodwill was what? If you can see here, working three I, right? So let me cross reference that. Um, I forgot the figure again. <laughs> 16202.74 okay so i put here 16202.74 and this is what working 3i you are cross-referencing the examiner knows where you got your figure from right so remember i told you, you are picking up ticks so the examiner will give you marks for all these things you've done so far right give you marks for every single valid and um, working you have put on paper um, thus far. So it's important, follow these steps, take a methodical approach to your um, computation and you'll be fine, right? You will definitely be fine. We've done good though. Let's do the second working under working three, which is what? NCI. So II is to work for what? NCI. The working for NCI is simple. If you want to remember, just tell yourself that the second line of goodwill working will always be the first line of NCI. So remember I told you goodwill is fair value of consideration, right? Then you add fair value of NCI at acquisition. Then you less fair value of net assets at acquisition. So I'm saying the second line of goodwill, which is this one, fair value of NCI at acquisition, will always be the um, first line of your NCI computation, right? So let's come to NCI and we say what? First line equals fair value of NCI at acquisition. What does it give you? The figure is what 7,500 here. Next thing you add is what? The NCI percentage of post acquisition retained earnings. So I'll say add NCI percentage of post acquisition let's even say reserves of who of the subsidiary so here is simply going to be what if you remember this question was a 70 percent ownership or 70 percent control 
So NCR will be what 30%. So it's going to be 30% of the difference between what the net asset of the subsidiary. That's all. So it's just going to 30% of the difference between this figure here and this figure here. That's all, right? So that's the year-end CSFP date figure for net assets of the subsidiary and acquisition date. The difference between the two is what will go. So 5280, 5280 minus what? Minus, so 5280, this minus 49300, minus 49300. So let me find this. Calculator um fifty two eight zero minus forty nine three hundred to give me nine eighty times what thirty percent this will give me two hundred and ninety four right if there was any impairment I would have less the NCI percentage of impairment but we don't have that so I just add these two so two nine four plus seven five hundred will give me what seven thousand seven nine four and this is my nci that i'll record in the financials right seven thousand seven hundred and ninety four so now that i have my nci you know i could have ideally brought it into the question but i need to know that nci is under equity and i cannot overestimate the space so let's finish let's do everything and let's start the question putting together the balance sheet last working to do and we are done and we start the, um, putting together the balance sheet is something called what the consolidated retained earnings right and here the standard working is always to start with the parent retained earnings as your base right always start with the parent retained earnings as your base so let's come here if you watch this question carefully this is retained earnings line What's the parent retained earnings? If you can see here, it's 105,000, right? So we pick this figure for a start when it comes to our retained earnings. So let's come back here. We know it's 105,000. So first line here will be what? Parents retained earnings is what 105,000 next thing you do is it's a direct mirror image of what is happening here so you can see here we added the NCI percentage of what the post acquisition which was a net asset so we'll now come and bring the 70 percent here if I give 30 percent to NCI here then the parent will get a remaining 70 that's all so here I'll say what instead of adding NCI percentage I'll add parents percentage of what post acquisition reserves of the sub or the subsidiary right so it's going to be 70 percent of the difference between what 50 to 8 0 minus 49 300 so it will be give me a second let me get my calculator again 5280 minus 49300 times 70 percent 0.7 this will give me 686 if there was um in payment i would have left it but take note remember there were a number of things that i told you will come and hit this engine room do you remember let's go up let me show you the first one right here, you know, this is net asset of subsidiary, so not this. Good. Remember I told you parents sold, so parents must suffer the unrealized profits or deduction. I told you here would we'll debit right here, would we'll debit parent retained earnings to the 125, right? And parent retained earnings is an equity item. So if you are debiting, it means you are going to what, reduce it, right? So I'll come here, 125, and I'll say... Provision for unrealized profits 
I'm going to deduct 125 because my double entry said what debit, right? 125. Then I remember there was something called unwinding interest. You remember that was also going to be what debited to yeah, right here. I said debit parent retained earnings with what 960.22. So I need to come and deduct 960.22 from this figure as well. So I come here and then I what I also oops, let me change the line. So this is to be less, so less this and also what less unwinding unwinding interest. I think it was 960.22. So I deduct. And what does that give me? So it becomes what? Let me just add them up. It becomes 105,000 plus 686 minus 125 minus 960.22 and what does that give me that gives me 104 600.78 okay so it gives me 104 600.78 so we are done with our workings finally right so now let's go back to the question let me show you how ideally you should be preparing your um, accounts. So good. Now, if you look at the balance sheet on the left hand side, you can see we have what? So let's start from here. We have property, plant, and equipment, right? Parents figure is 196, sub is 42,000. So we start adding across. That's the principle of groups. So we just say property. plant and equipment we just add parent was how much 196,000 plus subsidiary of what 42,000 there were no adjustment in this question so we just add 196 and 42 so 196,000 plus 42 it gives me 238,000 so I put here 238,000 right so we keep going now let's even appropriately label it these are what this is the asset section so these are assets then i have my what non current assets please make sure you have these headings you get a tick for all of these minor things right non-current assets then i can come to my current assets my current assets so here what the question gives you is what you what you record so here you can see we have what oh and all of you can see i ignore the investment right we never record this figure on the consolidated statement unless there's something called an external investment so do a quick check here we have sixty thousand. so the whole investment amount related to the subsidiary how do i know this watch here in note 2 they paid 46 million immediately and they promised to pay 14 in future 46 plus 14 will give you 60 right so because the whole 60 here relates to what purchase consideration for the subsidiary i eliminated if let's say this figure here was 70000 then i would have taken out the 60 and left to 10000 on the balance sheet and called it what external investment so take note here we didn't have that so we will ignore the whole amount entirely Current assets, we have what? Inventory, right? So, we record our inventories. Parent is what? Parent is 20,000 plus subsidiary of what? 10,000. Do you remember there was a fair adjustment? Let me show you. Um, where are you? In fact, before that, let you can even pick this up this one up first you can see here i said we are going to what credit inventory with 125 right so i need to watch inventory is an asset so i credit to it to reduce it so i need to what come and reduce inventory by 125 so this minus let me do the minus down here 
so minus 125 then i remember there was a fair value adjustment upwards of 30 do you remember right here this figure we said that would be at year end and it's upward adjustment so i add it here right you guys said you can you can see i told you all we're going to debit inventory with what 30 and then credit net assets of with 30. we've done the credit to net assets right here let me show you um here when we added it here we we're crediting by adding right so we come in um, debit inventory with 30 it means add 30 to inventory so here plus what 30 so i can now add up and say 20,000 plus 10,000 minus 125 plus 30 will give me 29,905. So I put here 29,905, right? Okay, let's keep going. What else do we have in the question? We have trade receivables. So I have my trade receivables. Parent is 19,000. Subsidiary is what? 8,500. This one, they didn't have any adjustment. So I add them as they are. So it's going to be 19,000 plus 8,500. That gives me 27,500 as my trade receivables figure. What else do I have in the question? I have cash and bank balance. So I can do that here. Cash and bank balance. Parent is how much? Um, 8,350. Right, so parent is 8,350 here. Sub is 3,825. So plus 3,825. I can add the two together. So it gives me um give me a second eight three five zero plus three eight two five it gives me twelve thousand one seven five right so that does it for my asset section so i can comfortably what add everything together so far to get my total assets so let's start from the top I start with my inventory of 16202.74 plus 238,000 plus 29,905 plus 27,500 plus 12,175. So that gives me, let me clean these things first. That gives me three two three seven eight two so three two three seven eight two point seven four right then i come to the next section of the balance sheet which is what total equity and liabilities so say let me even write proper thing the next section is actually the equity and liability section so equity and liabilities right so i can do my equity section and the equity please take note you don't consolidate the shares you just pick the parent shares figure we never consolidate shares so you don't add parent shares of 95 to sub shares of thirty thousand. no it's never done so i pick equity and i say what ordinary share capital this for the parent ordinary share capital what is the figure parents had what ninety five thousand the next thing the question gave us is retained earnings and in place of retained earnings please take note you come and use the consolidated one not the one in the question so what did we get for the consolidated retained earnings figure take note we got what one zero four right here one zero four six hundred point seven eight one zero four six hundred point seven eight so we'll come here and then we'll we slot that here 
so we say consolidated retained earnings i think that gave us 104 600.78 but please always cross reference your workings so this 104 600.78 i think it was um working three i i i so let me come here and then i write working three i i i so that is neatly cross referenced inventory where did we have the let's cross reference that as well you can just write working two to save time right everything was in working two for inventory so you can see we are cross-referencing all the figures that had extra work to be done. Next thing you need to bring here is what your NCI, which I think was working 3II. What did we get for NCI? Let's go pick that figure up. So NCI, we got what? 7794 right here. 7794. So we come back here. And then we get 7794. All right, but we are not done. If you watch the question, they also had what revaluation surplus, and it was for the parent. So here, once again, you don't consolidate parent equity. You use what you don't add parent and sub. You use what the parent has in the question. So you just bring here your revaluation surplus. The question said is what twenty thousand seven hundred. So you bring that figure here as well. Then in the natural progression of things, you can see the question talks about what the next line is non-current liabilities. So this is equity. Let's create a next line for non-current liabilities. What did the question have under that? You can see here they had what deferred consideration, right? So we also come here. Let me write deferred consideration. We will have to ignore the 14,000 they used in the question. This 14,000 here, we have to ignore it. Why? Because we have done our own discounting to present value, to find a present value. So if you remember, ladies and gentlemen, right here, you can see we got deferred consideration of what? 12,002.74, this guy here right oops 12,002.74 so it will be 12,002.74 plus what do you remember we had unwinding interest exactly so this unwinding interest what, what did we get remember i said you are going to what credit deferred consideration which is a liability so a credit will increase a liability with what 960.22 so plus 960 let me change the ink plus 960.22 what does that give us that will end up giving me let me add it to give me a second 12002.74 plus 960.22 that will give me um 12000 962.74 right 12,962.96 all right then the next thing we need to talk about is what our current current liabilities current liabilities right so under current liabilities what must you know just pick what the question gave you right in front of you so you can see here we have what trade payables so I bring here trade payables. What was parents figure? Parents figure was what? 30,000 plus subsidiary of what? 9,500. So give me a second. That should definitely give me 39,500. When well, deferred consideration, I did the workings in what? Working two since I'm cross referencing and everything, right? Okay. Next thing the question gave me here was what income tax payable. So I write 
Yes, I get my pen. Okay. Income tax payable. Parent was what? 20,500. Subsidiary was 4,575. So let me add these together. Give me a second. That gives me 2,500 plus 4,575. And that gives me 25,075, right? 25,075. Last thing in the question they gave us was what accrued expenses right here. So I just write the same thing. Accrued expenses. So that one, there's no addition, no subsidiary figure. So I just put the figure here of what? 18,150 right and i can now begin to add them up so let's start from the equity side so with my calculator i should be expecting to get three two three that figure up there right so i add ninety five thousand so ninety five thousand plus one zero four six hundred point seven eight plus what seven seven 94 plus 20,700 plus what? 12,962.96 plus 39,500 plus 25,075 plus 18,150. And that gives me three, two, three balance dates, right? So let me clean the highlights first. One, two, three, four. Okay, good. That gives me three, two, three, seven, eight, two point seven four. And this figure is my total equity and liabilities right total equity and liability so as you can see we balanced um this question three two three seven eight two point seven four okay all right so this will be the procedure to go through a question let me go through what you need to do in terms of steps you can see i told you the key thing is to get ticks in the exam, please do not attempt. If you are able to, that's fine. Remember I told you for each question, you are required to do what? Answer every question within what? A certain time frame. So the point I'm really making here is that when it comes to this topic, right? There's a procedure to go through. And like I was saying, if it's a 20 mark question, you need to make sure that like I told you, it's a three hour paper, so 1.8 minutes per each mark, right? So let's come back to the question. In a question like this, which is for 20 marks, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to what, spend maximum 36 minutes. And please, I'm serious about this, right? Stick to 36 minutes. When it's up, move on. Whether you are done or not, move on. By 36 minutes, you'd have done enough of these what, workings to get the ticks, right? But please, to be able to work fast in FR, you need to what, do a lot of questions. The more questions you do, the more you can do this within the time. Obviously, I'm taking you guys through this question, so I have to walk you through step by. If I was doing this myself, I'm sure, if I'm not exaggerating, maybe less than 10 minutes, I can do this beginning to end in less than 10 minutes, right? Because I've done it so many times, I've done consolidation so many times. But in the exam, practice will make you perfect. So please, between now and then, do try your hands on different questions. But please do not, I keep saying, don't focus on balancing it. Focus on going through all the, the different notes to the question and focus on what? Getting the different notes right. Focus on getting marks for each note in the question, right? Pick up as many marks as you can, right? So now that we have established, we've gone through one full question, let me talk about, let me lay out a process when it comes to um, solving questions on groups, right? Let's do this. So when it comes to groups, right, there are a number of standard workings. 
But even before we go there, let me talk about one question that has been coming in recent times. When you check question five of the last three sittings, you realize that in question five, usually question five C or D, the last one, it's usually about groups and it's about the theory part of group. So it will be either a question on IFRS 3, business combinations, or IFRS 10, consolidations. Please don't let those marks go. I've already, we've already agreed here that we'll answer all questions, right? So please, back in those questions, they ask you things like, what are the signs that are indicative of control? They could even ask you things around them. You know, there are conditions where a parent would be required to consolidate, but they'll get an exemption because of what's having met some conditions. I've seen a question to when they ask them, um, mention the signs that are indicative of what's control. Please ensure that you go through those. In fact, if you want assurance or certainty, please read, um, look at the past questions, look at the things that they've asked in the past, right? And then address those particular areas. Please, the theory questions on group accounts appear in question five. Please don't let those ones go. As you are aware, tomorrow or the next time we meet, um, which will be on Wednesday, I believe, yeah, we'll be looking at um, the consolidated income statement, right? So that's another animal on its own. But please, for now, know that there are theory questions on groups that please go through the past questions and then make sure you master those parts. Don't let those marks go. So back to the procedure I was talking about. When it comes to groups, remember I told you, let's lay out the standard working. So I said, first step is what? Open your what? your template that is a consolidated statement of financial position second step is to what start your workings please pay attention start your workings on what a different page next thing you need to do is to what working one which is what the group structure then you do what working two which is your consolidation adjustments including what the net assets remember i told you net assets is always prepared for the subsidiary or an associate if one exists but never for the parent right how does it look like we say what net assets it will be at two date assets acquisition and then what csfp date right so you put what ordinary share capital retained earnings and the rest right so these come here please pay attention i'm trying to give you a simplified framework after you do this, then go to what you're working three. So this is step five, but it's working three. Working three has three sub workings. First one is what? Goodwill. How do you compute goodwill? Goodwill is what? The fair value of consideration, which will be a figure. Then you add fair value of NCI at acquisition. Oops acquisition which would be a figure then you less what fair value of net assets at acquisition then this will give you what your goodwill then in some questions which they'll give you less your impairment of goodwill and this will give you your goodwill figure to be recorded in the balance sheets Right, so this is a template for goodwill. And as we learned today, under consideration, you could have what deferred consideration. You could have even something called contingent consideration. That is consideration that is dependent on something else happening. You could also have something called share for share exchange. Right, so there are past questions that have looked at all of these different aspects. And I'm I'm planning to do a lot, another question I'll probably upload on this channel in subsequent days right but for now just know that consideration can be broken up into what deferred contingent share for share exchange and all of that right it could even be a mixture of what issuing shares and issuing debt instruments and all of that right 
All right, so that's it for Goodwill. How does NCI look like? I told you what second line of Goodwill will be your first line of NCI, right? So it becomes fair value of NCI at acquisition. Then I add what the NCI share or percentage of the post acquisition reserves of the subsidiary so that will typically be the nci percentage times what one figure minus another figure typically what i always say is we use this figure here to compute goodwill what do i mean it is this figure net assets that flows into what fair value of net assets here then we use the difference between these two figures, right? The difference between these two figures will feed into what NCI and then what parent or consolidated retained earnings, right? So this figure is used to compute goodwill. Then the difference is used to compute NCI and parent retained earnings. So NCI here will be the difference between what opening and then what closing, right? Then if there's impairment, you less what the NCI percentage of what goodwill impairment. That would be a figure here. Right. And that should typically give you your NCI value for the question. Then the final working you do is to do your consolidated retained. earnings how does that look like simple you always start with the parents retained earnings then you add what the same way you added the nci share of post acquisition reserves here right you do same but this time for the parents share so you add what parents percentage of post acquisition reserves of sub so this will be piece percentage of what remember i told you the net asset closing minus what opening i'll give you this figure then you less if there's impairment you less what the parents percentage of what impairment you deduct it from here right and that will be it really but let me even do an expanded let me give you a number of things that could feature into net asset right let's let's play the game well so let me say the net assets of the subsidiary asset what acquisition date and csft date so typically you have things like what share capital and i mentioned that here and the share capital they will typically be equal unless the question tells you that since acquisition the subsidiary has what issued additional shares if not they are almost always equal then you have a line for what retained earnings so here what is on the balance sheet to be the csfp date then here they'll give you the figure or you probably have to determine yourself in most cases then we can have fair value adjustment if it's fair value adjustment of the subsidiary's asset and the question mentions that that um adjustment or the fair valuation was done at acquisition then you put the same figure here and put the same figure here right but if you have a case where fair value adjustment they say it was done after acquisition then you put it here you just put the fair value adjustment here if you have cases of provision for unrealized profit and take note this is where the subsidiary sold then it will be dash and acquisition by deducted from what csfp date right what if you have depreciation of what asset so this fair value adjustment in this question related to inventory it could relate to what pp so if you have what post acquisition depreciation then as, as usual here will be dash and then deducted from here 
right so these are like very basic workings that i think it covers a lot of the things you need to know right then this figure goes to do what good will then the difference between this and this will go to do nci and consolidated what retained earnings so let's come back to here here if parent sells to subsidiary then you come and less what the provision for realized profit from here rather take notes right and um that is it really okay so this is this is a um, high level what you need to know when it comes to what the preparation of consolidated financial statements once again let me reiterate your job is not to balance the question your job is to go there and get as many marks as possible to pick up as many um marks as many ticks as you can within the 36 minute period let's remain consistent let's try our best to in every single question that we have in front of us to try and then what get it right to get as many marks as possible if you can balance it perfect if you can't then please and please again pick up as many marks as you can so i'll leave us with these words we are going to attempt to in every single question we have in front of us do it within the allotted time not exceed time and still try to what, capture as many marks as we can between our exam please practice a lot more past questions look at a lot more scenarios look at the things that have changed look at what the examiner could twist the notes to make it look like but ultimately like i keep saying believe you can believe you are prepared right so for one final time let's all do this together let's go back into the comments and let's type once again in, in unison together let's all type i can i will i must we keep telling ourselves is that we have it within ourselves right so let's go into the notes again the comments we type i can i will i must let's all do this i can i will i must it might be difficult it might be tough it might be challenging but yes we are capable we are able we can we can do a great job on exam day so um as we are closing today let us remember that if you are prepared an opportunity comes you will succeed right so i've taken you through today's session it is up to you now to go look for a few more questions, sharpen your exam technique, know what in what what means when the examiner says what, right? Look at different scenarios and try and practice within 36 minutes. You know that that is your limit. You're not going to exceed 36 minutes for a 20 mark question. And with all of these, and with a good amount of technique and good healthy level of self-confidence, I believe success will be yours. So on that note, let's end today's session. I will catch you same time on Wednesday as we look at the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. And one thing I'll tell you is I realize the examiner these days is asking a lot more questions in that area. I don't know why. So we'll look at it as well. So do enjoy the rest of your evening and I will catch you on Wednesday. Bye-bye for now.